from a con who tried to buy an NHL team to two players being traded for a dollar. Here are four crazy stories that you've probably never heard of. Kane, Spinorama scores! Patrick Kane! Oh dear! Who has heard the story about a 32 year old man who scams people to buy the Islanders? He's a Kane, two on one, hustling back to point out a shot. No! If you haven't, then step right in. and get ready for a crazy one. Let's go back to the year 1995 and meet the man John Spano, a Texas businessman who just decided one day he wanted to be the owner of an NHL team. And he had his eyes set on the Dallas Stars, makes sense because he lives in Texas, and he reached out to Jim Lights, the president to begin negotiations. He offered $42 million to buy 50% interest in the team. Obviously nowadays that would be laughable, but back then it actually sounded like a pretty good offer. But it was just too good to be true. Spano started to make unreasonable demands and then the owner Norman Green had enough of his antics and decided to sell the team to somebody else. Lights would later go on to say that for Spano to be as wealthy as he claimed, a hundred million dollars of net worth, he could not afford to furnish a 2.5 million dollar mansion. And when leaving the business dinners, Spano insisted that Lights would pay the tab. Very sus, if you ask me. A year later, Spano made a bid for the Florida Panthers, but after some thought, the then owner decided he didn't really want to sell the team. Spano wasn't going to give up his hope of owning a team though. So when the New York Islanders were up for grabs, he agreed to buy the troubled franchise for $165 million from John Pickett. And how did he do this exactly? Well, he forged financial documents and claimed to have inherited a large sum of money from his wealthy grandfather to make it look like his net worth was really $230 million. And next was to actually face the challenge of coming up with the money. Somehow. This man managed to secure an $80 million loan from Fleet Bank in Boston with his forged documents. While trying to raise the rest of the money, he tried to get money from a Long Island hotel owner, Cablevision, and contractors who would potentially build a new arena, but all of those attempts failed. He missed the close deadline to make a $17 million payment and send a wire transfer for $1,700. Of course, he did this so he could claim, like he did, that he messed up the number of zeros to buy himself more time, of course. And when it came to making a $5 million payment, he wired 5,000. His non-payments were enough for Pickett, who requested Gary Bettman would remove Spano from control of the team until the dispute could be settled. Some of the Islander executives were also done with Spano, and they reached out to Newsday anonymously to investigate Spano's background. Their investigation revealed that Spano was only worth $5 million, but Newsday was the least of his worries. The FBI would start to look into him. Federal prosecutors charged Spano with multiple counts of bank fraud, wire fraud, and forgery. Prosecutors obtained evidence of the forged documents. He pled guilty to the charges, admitting to forging documents to defraud the Islanders and Pickett. He was sentenced to 71 months in federal prison and ordered to pay restitution of $11.9 million to his victims. He only served four years before being on a supervised release. But his freedom didn't last very long because in February of 2005, he was arrested again for defrauding numerous companies by promising to obtain loans for them and pocketing the fees without getting the loans. Why would anybody even trust him after the NHL incident? That doesn't make any sense to me. But anyways, after getting caught for the second time, he was sentenced to 51 months in prison and was released in 2009. Well. That is the story of John Spano and his criminal attempts to own the Islanders. Uh, 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 oh wait, th th there's more? If you thought this guy really stayed out of the eyes of the law, you're sadly mistaken. In 2014, he was indicted by a grand jury in Ohio to one count of theft and 44 counts of forgery. Spano pleaded guilty to stealing $70,000 in commissions on fraudulent accounts. 
he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and ordered to pay $75,000 in restitution to his employers. I guess we're gonna have to wait and see what he's gonna do the next time he's released to get some quick money to pay off his debts. Now, what does Jeremy Roenick, Rick Tockett, and Travis Green all have in common? Well, if you knew the right answer was Operation Slapshot, then I must say you probably googled the question. Ya cheetah! When you do illegal things, you're bound to get caught at some point. If you're doing illegal things, you probably shouldn't be a cop. Or better off, don't upset a co-worker who may tip you off to your bosses. James Hardy learned that the hard way. One of his co-workers sent an anonymous tip that Hardy was in charge of running an illegal sports betting ring out of his house. In a 40-day period, they found evidence of more than a thousand wagers that totaled over $1.7 million. There were 12 NHL players, including Jeremy Roenick and Travis Green, being the big names that people closely associated with the NHL. And they were caught placing bets on sports. But they actually never bet on hockey. Harney was not alone in running the betting ring. I mean, come on now, we had Rick Tockett after all, who was the assistant coach of the Phoenix Coyotes at the time as his partner. Harney was in charge of running operations and Tockett was in charge of the money. Bad idea. Tockett was the only person connected to the NHL to be indicated on charges. They utilized testimonies of those who were connected in the NHL to use against Tockett. Harney was charged with money laundering, official misconduct, conspiracy, and promoting gambling. He pled guilty to all counts and wanted to help himself, so he started snitching on Tockett. Joke's on him though, because he was sentenced to six years in prison. Tockett himself was charged with money laundering, conspiracy, and promoting gambling. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman suspended Tockett a day after he was accused of being part of the ring. Tockett pled guilty to all counts, but was only handed a two-year probation sentence. Had Tockett and those who were connected to the NHL gambled on NHL games, Oh boy, Tockett's sentence would have been severe. And as most of you already know, he was let back into the league because the NHL really doesn't care about their rules, and he's now the head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. It often takes something real bad to happen for there to be changes set in motion for more rules or safer equipment. Art Ross, not the trophy, the person, helped design a net that we see in the current NHL but has some modifications to his original net for good reasons. The net he had helped design had a B shape with curves and a pointed middle center. The design was supposed to help trap pucks and stop them from hitting the back of the net and flying right back out and also to reduce the number of disputed goals. The net came into question in 1980 when Mark Howe was involved in a horrible injury. He crashed into the net at a high speed and was impaled by the center spike. And where he is impaled is not for the faint of heart. When he slid into the net, he suffered a 5 inch gash on his rectal area. He narrowly missed severing his spinal column. Hal lost 3 pints of blood on the ice before he could be removed. Following the injury, he lost 21 pounds when he was forced to stick to a liquid diet to avoid intestinal infections. You would kind of think that the NHL would be quick to find a temporary fix for the net until a safer one could be brought in at least, but it actually took them six years to change them out. Thankfully, they weren't any more gruesome injuries during those six years. Because remember, it's not just the NHL players that really get affected by these rules, it's everybody who plays hockey, because almost every single league, especially in Canada, follow the NHL rules to a T. And even in a lot of minor leagues where there's a couple of different rules, they're as similar as possible to the NHL, so when players actually do get to those levels, they can adapt. So six years really is a long time, because then those minor leagues also have to wait, and once they're able to afford to change the net, they finally will, which is probably 10 to 20 years after. Now, when we ask the question, which NHL trade could be considered the biggest insult to the player? Well, we really hope you say Ray Shepard or Chris Draper. And that's right, both players were traded for what? One dollar! That's right, a single buck! Ray Shepard is the first player to be traded for a dollar. He was drafted by the Buffalo Sabres in the third round of the 1984 draft. His rookie season with the Sabres in 1987 ended with 65 points in 74 games. Not bad numbers for a rookie. 
and the next two seasons, he combined 49 points in 85 games. The biggest problem, really, was that Shepard suffered a severe ankle injury and wasn't even in the 89-90 season. But, the old coach didn't really care that Shepard wasn't the greatest skater and wasn't helpful at all in the defensive end because he kept scoring. The new coach was the opposite and along with the GM wanted Shepard off the team. So during the offseason, the Sabres traded him to the Rangers for a dollar. Man, I never use coins anymore but that's like a loony, are you kidding me? And in this single season with the Rangers, he earned 47 points in 59 games before being traded to the Red Wings where he played with Chris Draper who will be featured next. He was bounced around on four teams and ultimately became a free agent the season after he played with the Rangers. He respectfully ended his career playing in 817 games and earning 657 points. Sadly, he never won a Stanley Cup and is one of the better players who never won. But, for not even being worth a tootie in the eyes of the Sabres, he definitely showed his true value. Now Chris Draper, he was drafted in the third round of the 1989 draft by the Winnipeg Jets. We're gonna give the Jets a little bit of slack here because Draper only played 20 games in four seasons, so that's not very good. The Red Wings though, saw potential in Draper and the Jets traded Draper for a buck. Fun fact, it was only three years between the Shepard trade that he would become traded for a dollar too. And when he arrived, he played 46 games in the AHL and never looked back. Draper stated that he didn't really know his exact value until he played the Sharks in the 94 playoffs. After an interview with a reporter from the San Jose newspaper, he was blindsided by a question. The reporter turned to him and asked, Hey, not bad for a kid who was traded for a dollar, huh? The reporter was walking away when Draper said, Excuse me? What, what did you just say? The reporter said, Yeah, a dollar. Winnipeg traded you for a buck. Now you're playing in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Pretty good. Wait, you don't know the story? Confused as one would naturally be, he looked at the public relations guy who told him, uh, yeah, Chris, it's true. And Chris was baffled and asked, what? I was traded for future considerations? That's like the Sean Monaghan trade 20 years from now. Yeah, well, you know, when Scotty called you up from the AHL, they still hadn't worked out the considerations officially. So Brian Murray called Mike Smith and, well, you were traded for cash considerations. A buck, asked Draper. A buck, the PR dude responded. Draper played 17 seasons with the Red Wings, winning four Stanley Cups and one Selkie before retiring. We don't know which one is more insulting, being traded for a dollar or not currently being honored in the Hall of Fame. Thanks for watching guys, and don't forget to leave a comment about which story you didn't know about. And if you feel we're missing one, please let us know and we're gonna add it to the next one. Click the video on the screen to watch the craziest meltdown moments. And, as always, if you like this video, don't be a bender. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, help the algorithm help us grow, and see you next time.